In this presentation, we're going to look at some of the fundamental areas of security. This includes a basic introduction to outline some of the main terms that it will use and some of the main issues. The ISO 2702, risk analysis, and then on to security policies. A basic outline of some of the threats involved, some key principles, and then some overall conclusions. At the present time, we're moving what, from what's called an industrial age into an information age, where things and methods of doing things are changing. For example, our postal system is being largely replaced by an email system, paper voting by e-voting, a telephone system is now being replaced by a voice over IP system, and physical shopping by e-shopping. For us to be able to move correctly from an industrial age into an information age, there are three basic fundamentals that we need. And these three fundamentals are confidentiality, authentication and assurance. With authentication, we aim to properly authenticate users, devices and servers and also even network connections. With confidentiality, we typically want data that is either stored or transmitted to be kept confidential. And this typically involves encryption. And then we want to make sure that the data, when it's stored or transmitted, has some assurance so that we know that it has not been changed. The major problem that we have is that we typically look at systems uh, in a layered approach. So in this case we might have our network infrastructure as a foundation. We need some application communication protocol to be able to communicate between applications and services and then we have the applications and services themselves. And then at the end of the line we also have the user so the user may use an application and then use an application protocol to communicate. Then they use the network infrastructure to send the data and then it goes back to the user on the other end. The major problem that we typically have is that each of these elements, such as the network infrastructure, can be made fairly secure. But the problem tends to be at the interfaces between these levels. So the interface between the network infrastructure and the application communication protocol and the applications themselves into the protocol can be left insecure. So the key insecurity is to make sure that all the elements, including the user, are kept integrated so that we have an integrated security policy. So some of the key principles for this are CIA, confidentiality, integrity and insurance, and we also get AAA, which is authentication, authorization, and accounting. So the main issue that we have is typically how to keep these interfaces secure and make sure that the overall system is kept secure and integrated. A focus on one area may leave some weakness in another area. So what is it we're trying to, do to protect against? Well, the lowest level is typically the home user. The home user uh, is typically an individual on their own and they tend to have a fairly limited budget, possibly of only a thousand pounds or so. They will typically have a PC and some basic scripting tools. This level is fairly easy to protect against. As the level goes up, then there is possibly more money involved in, in an intrusion. So a professional data miner might have a larger budget and they might have some money to be able to invest in intrusion uh, methods. As we go up, uh, we have industri industrial espionage where the budget can increase because it might involve some important design of a system. And then we have government activities which might have budgets of hundreds of millions of pounds and then at the top level homeland or large-scale military uh, 
activities could have budgets of billions. As we go up the various levels, it becomes more difficult to defend against. So what we typically do is that we have a, a, a perimeter for our organisation and then we have our firewall. And it's the objective of the firewall to keep out the intrusions. So we might have data stealing, external hacks, denial of service, personal abuse, worms and viruses, fraud and terrorism. And what we're trying to protect are our systems, our assets, our data and obviously our users. And we want these uh, entities to have access to email, web and so on. The biggest problem though is that it's been shown that many of the breaches actually come from inside the, the corporate network. So the gateway firewall can only solve some of the problems in that our problems could actually be on our own site. So this is our perimeter here. So we have a policy, some security policy or audit policy, which is applied onto the network infrastructure and then on to our servers and our, our hosts. We might have some event detection, uh, which will detect certain events, such as an intrusion on the network, and some network sensors, which might be used to gather some information about the, the uh, operation of the overall system. So we might also have server logs, event logs, host logs, and so on, and they can be used at some later time uh, in face of uh, an intrusion so that the, the overall system can, can learn. Okay, so let's look at one of the most important standards related to security, which is ISO 2702. Basically, it came from, uh, started life as the Information Security Code of Practice from the DTI in the UK and it's published as long as ago as 1990 and it's recently been standardised uh, as ISO 2702 and basically it lists 11 main clauses which should be uh, seen as good practice within an organisation. One of the clauses is business continuity planning and for this, it is important for the organisation to define the critical business processes and then to have some, uh, some methodology to ensure that these business processes can, uh, can still work through interruptions. We also have access control and for this we, contr we control the uh, access to information and also limit unauthorised access to it. It also includes remote and teleworking work which is becoming uh, an, a key issue in security. Another clause relates to system acquisition, development and maintenance and this tries to ensure that the systems are built on a secure infrastructure. It also tries to ensure that the prevents loss, modification or misuse of user data, to protect the confidentiality, authentic authenticity and integrity of information, ensures that uh, IT projects are run in a secure manner, and it maintains the security of uh, application software and data. Clause 4 here is physical and environmental security and that tries to stop uh, un unauthorised uh, physical aspect, as, uh, physical access to systems and, and data. Clause 5 here is compliance and that's to make sure that the organisation complies with any criminal or civil law and any of its statutory or contractual ob obligements, obligations. It also ensures that systems uh, are, abide 
with policies and standards. Six relates to human resource security and that focuses on the reduction of risks of human error, theft and fraud. It ensures that, that people are aware of security with inside the organisational content and it also tries to, to minimise the damage from security incidents and obviously learn from an incident that happens. This is actually one of the most difficult areas uh, in, in all the clauses. There is organisational security and that's to make sure that there is uh, some management of the overall system it, uh, that they maintain uh, control of the security of their assets and also by third parties and also for outsourcing to other organisations. There is computer and network security and that's to make sure that the network equipment is kept secure especially uh, in protecting against damage and loss of data. Asset Clause 9 relates to asset classif classification and control to make sure that all the assets are tagged in, in some way and have an appropriate level of protection. 10 relates to the security policy for the organisation. 11 is some uh, definition of the security incident management and that's how to anticipate for future uh, breaches and how they are responded to. And then 12 relates to risk analysis. Risk analysis is one of the most important areas of security and it's the focus on trying to identify the risk to the organisation defining the costs associated with that risk and then defining the whether it's worth mitigating it or not. A key focus in security is to make sure your key assets are kept secure. So for every risk there is a likelihood of that risk happening. So it can be highly likely, such as that the, the sun will set every day, or it could have a low likelihood such as a lightning strike. And then there is a cost associated with each risk. It might have low cost or high cost. So if something is highly likely to happen and it has a, a high cost associated with it, then it's probably not worth mitigating against. It's possible to get insurance that uh, that covers the costs of this event but as it has a low likelihood the organisation may decide that it isn't worth the, the investment in mitigating against it. Also if something is highly likely and it has low cost then it's probably worth mitigating against this risk. The most difficult areas are where it's highly likely where there's a low likelihood and there is also a low cost or where there is a high, li high likelihood with a high cost. It is in these regions that uh, it takes expert uh, knowledge to be able to decide whether to mitigate or against a risk or not. So there are many, many different types of risks and for their probability of happening. So general hardware risks are fairly high in terms of their, their occurrence. Static discharge is, is another risk within an organisation and that also has a fairly high chance of happening. When it comes to errors on systems, input error is, is one of the highest risks. Programming errors are also fairly high and operating errors 
uh, are also a high probability of risk. When it comes to system compromise, then we might have loose documents, an improper release, improper marking, and also ex-employee access. You can see here that uh, the biggest risk is typically with improper marking, in that a document could be marked incorrectly and then go to the to the wrong person. For password compromise, uh, we have system entry as as a risk and uncleared visit, which could in some uh, circumstances give quite a high risk factor. For fire, then obviously the 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 risk of an explosion is a fairly low uh, probability along with a catastrophe. A minor fire has a, a higher risk. For forced entry we might have burglary that typically relates to the to the area and country and environment of the organization. Vandalism is fairly fairly high risk uh, along with a disgruntled employee. Terrorism actually has quite a low risk associated uh, risk probability associated with it. With lightning, it obviously depends on the 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 place where the organization is, is based and it can go up to a fairly high uh, risk factor. And power, power failure is also another fairly high risk. External power uh, is fairly low compared to an irregular irregularity with inside the organization or uh, an insufficient power supply. So the organization might look at the, the risks involved uh, on the organization. And then they might come up with an annual loss expectancy value. And with this we look at the cost we look at the likelihood of uh, an event, and then from the cost, we can we can multiply with the likelihood and get the ATE. So in this case, the risk of a major fire has been assessed as sixteen thousand two hundred pound. Lightning strike is seen as a 0.3 uh, chance of happening, and we can see here all the elements that would be required if a lightning strike hit a network. So in this case 2700 is seen as the annual loss. A long term power loss the likelihood is 0.1 and again we take the cost in this lost time, data recovery, bad press, loss of business and so on. I can, we can see here that we have a £16,000 annual loss. So it's with these values that we decide the actual cost per year and with this cost we can decide whether we mitigate against something or not. So in this case a £16,000 hit per year might be enough to uh, justify a, a UPS system on an internal power generator. The biggest problem with risk is there is typically different contexts for it. And overall there is a business context and that typically focuses on the the income or loss of income to, uh, to a company or the loss of face. And there's a technical context which typically involves loss of data, loss of systems, loss of power and so on. And the major problem that we have is to try and get the business co business people to be able to communicate with technical people in some coherent way in terms of risk. One way is to define an ontology. So in this case we have a threat to the organisation. 
which may reduce an asset value of a certain asset inside the target of our evaluation in a certain context. And again, a threat may exploit a, vulnerabil a vulnerability which opens up a risk which contains a certain likelihood of an unwanted incident and has a certain consequence. So we can see here that uh, an ontology allows us to define the, the key terms that we might want to use so that uh, it has a business context and also a technical context. When it comes to the management of risk, then we can also define a basic framework for this. We can establish a context for the risk, identify it, then try and analyse the, the risks involved, especially for the frequency, consequence, and also for the level of risk. Then we can actually evaluate these risks, and then we do our cost-benefit and decide whether we accept the risk or not. If we, if, we, if we do not accept the risk, then we need to treat it in some way, otherwise uh, we, we monitor and review. At each of these stages, we want to be able to consult and communicate with our staff to make sure that everyone in the organisation understands uh, the risks involved. And along we make sure that we monitor and review uh, our processes. A key element of, of uh, security is the, the security policy. And with this, we typically take the aims and objectives of an organisation. We take its legal, moral and social responsibilities and a key element is that we also take the technical feasibility and we feed these in to defining our overall policy for the organisation. It is then up to typically the IT personnel to then implement that policy and that could be in terms of operating system rights, domain rights, firewall rules, event logs, application rights and so on. Then once it is in place it is important to evaluate how well it actually matches the policy uh, definition and it may be possible to update and refine this policy. This continual refinement is important in any organisation to make sure the continual focus of the, secu of the security policy. Along with this, we need to make sure that it's actually working correctly so in our policy implementation, we typically uh, add in some auditing facilities to make sure that it's working. And then this is then verified, and again, this can be used to inform the policy. External auditors and also internal audits can actually look at these audit logs to make sure that everything is working as it should. So the key elements of a, of, a, of a policy, the policy that we have, is to obviously protect our system, to deter, to log, react to a security event, recover, and also to audit and verify. So m there'll be more information on, on these areas at near the end of this lecture. So an example of, uh, of a security policy in implementation is for uh, web applications, have a web.config file, and this is an XML definition of what's allowed to actually happen on that file. Okay, so let's look at the threats that uh, a system or organization might face. One of the most difficult to mitigate against is visual spying. 
and that can involve an intruder actually watching the keystrokes or mouse clicks of a user in, a, in order to determine their password, user ID and other details. It is fairly difficult to mitigate against this apart from improving employee training to make sure that they, that they keep their keystrokes secure, especially when they're signing into things. Misrepresentation uh, is another difficult one in that someone can send an email or, or phone up uh, a user and ask them for their username and password by saying that they are IT support. And many users will actually give back their user ID and, and passwords. Eavesdropping is another particular problem and the eavesdropping involves listening to the communications uh, between uh, users and, and systems. And the important thing here is that if communications are to be kept secure and secret, then encryption should be used for this communication. Another particular problem and one that is growing is logical scavenging. And that involves looking over discarded uh, hard disks, USB drives and disks for data. And the key thing with this is that uh, even though it looks as if files have actually been deleted, there can still also be a remnant of parts or complete files available to uh, someone who is scavenging the, the data. It is important that, that that data is or data systems are always uh, are always uh, set up so that uh, the there is a complete erasure of all the the data on the disk before it is discarded. Interference is a is a particular problem, especially in wireless networks. If there is a corporate wireless network then an intruder could set up a high-powered radio transmitter outside the network and this can actually jam the whole of the corporate network. It may also be possible to set up a, a transmitter at the same frequency, same channels, so that there is a reduction in the quality of the service on the wireless network. There's also physical attacks and physical removal, which are difficult to, to mitigate against. Uh, equipment should be locked up in secure areas, uh, network equipment especially. A particular growing problem is spoofing, where uh, a device can be spoofed. For example, in a wireless access point, if, uh, if someone normally care next to a corporate wireless access point, the intruder could come along and set up their own access point with the same name and same details as the as their main access access point. The user could then connect to this and the intruder could actually take their their data. Impersonation is a is also a particular problem and that's where a, a user pretends to be uh, someone else that they aren't. We'll see this, an example of this in a little minute. Piggyback is typically where we take valid information and then an intruder can piggyback information or programs on the back of this. An example of this uh, is with an email containing a, a virus where the virus has piggybacked itself into the email. Network weaving involves uh, the intruder setting up uh, a network weave where it's fairly difficult to actually find out the original source of the intrusion. And that's typically involved involving confusing the, the routing process. Trojan horses are programs which uh, are made to look valid but will typically do uh, damage. So in this case the Trojan, a Trojan horse could be a program, an, an illicit program with inside an email 
when the email is opened, the program will run. It might also be an enticing link. You can see here, best project ever, click. And once the user clicks on it, then it could install a Trojan horse on the machine. These Trojan horses can be fairly quiet uh, in their operation and stay dormant for some time. Then they could become logic bombs, which are typically triggered by an event or at some time in the future. Worms and viruses have been a particular problem. Viruses uh, can also typically self-replicate themselves. And a worm itself, the focus of a worm uh, is typically to use up either and a network resource or a host resource such as CPU usage, disk or network or even the, the memory. And a worm will typically spread by replicating itself. One becomes two, two becomes four and so on. Many security systems now detect the, the spread of worms so we can get what are called slow burning worms which are slow to, to replicate themselves, but can still spread over a, a network. Another particular problem is denial of service, or DOS. In this case, we have the intruders, which are EVE, which might be small programs running on each of the hosts. And they have been set up to access a certain resource, in this case the web server, over the network. So it might be that this web server becomes exhausted in coping with the requests from Eve so that Bob cannot get the required quality service when he tries to access the web server. We can also get network exhaustion where there is so much traffic in certain parts of the network that Bob again cannot get his requests through. So there's two types of denial service. One is core denial service where it's one machine or one host which does the, the requesting of the services. In this case, it's fairly easy to, to protect against this in that we find out the nearest firewall and block all accesses. A distributed denial of service, or DDoS, is where there are many hundreds, thousands, or even millions of distributed uh, agents uh, across a wide network and it's almost impossible to block access as blocking it from one domain could block the rest of the domain. Inference is another problem that we can have and that's where uh, an intruder could exploit a database weakness using inferences. So if we take an example and that uh, it is possible to uh, get the average mark for our students, but it's not possible to get individual marks. An intruder could then uh, exploit this. If we take the, if they do three accesses, the first case they take the average of Bob and Alice, the second case the average between Bob and Eve, and then the third case between Alice and Eve. Once you get the averages, if we take average 1 minus average 2, then we get Alice minus Eve upon 2. And then we add on the third average, then we end up with Alice's mark. So Alice's mark is the first average minus the second plus the third. So we take an example of this. Bob got 10%, Mar uh, Alice got 20, and Eve got 30. So the average of the first one is 15. The average between Bob and and Eve is 20 and the average between Alice and Eve is 25. And if we plug these in, 15 minus 20 plus 25, we see that Alice's mark is 20. So the intruder has managed to infer information from a query which was not uh, valid. It is important to understand inference in that uh, key information might be given out just by inferring information from certain queries. Another problem might be covert channels, and covert channels involve sending uh, extra information within with inside uh, a valid channel. We can see here two data packets have been sent between Bob and Alice, and 
Bob has, uh, or Eve, Eve has managed to add on a character G with inside the, the network packet TTL and then an O so that uh, on the other side whoever reads the convert channel could actually read this message even though the main message is a, is a valid one. The two main types of convert channels are what are called storage channel that's where we modify uh, an object, in this case the object is data packets or it is possible to do it through a timing channel so for example uh, if Bob accesses a, a certain website at a certain time that's taken as a, as a binary 1 if he doesn't it's a binary, binary 0 so later in these series lectures we'll have a look at convert channels then we might also have an active attack and an active attack will typically exploit some, some weakness in the system so in this case it might be that this causes a, a buffer overflow when there is a long uh, line, a long string in the, in the access. So we can see here if the system is not protected somebody could try and log in with a, an extremely long username and that could cause the system to act incorrectly. There's authorization attacks, and this involves trying to gain access to a higher level from a lower level uh, form of entry. Trapdoor impersonation is, is a particular problem where a user is faced with what looks like a valid uh, entry to a system. In this case, we have eBay, but unfortunately, it isn't the real eBay it is one that has been that is impersonating it as far as the user knows then this is a perfectly correct website it has all the correct graphics but the we can see here that the the domain is incorrect so an example of this might be uh, this email this real email and we can see here when we run uh, the whole of this area is, is a graphic uh, which which is always a, a, a particular uh, sign that it, that it could be a, 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 a trapdoor and when we run our cursor over it we can actually see that the the link actually doesn't go to, to where it says it does even though it says this is the link in the text it is this link here where we can see a certain IP address on a certain port 680 is the is the destination. So we've got uh, fairly. This is a spoofed email address. Any email address can be put in here. Uh, the 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 URL looks very suspicious, and then when we do a lookup we actually find that it ends up not in eBay but some destination uh, Korean website. When we actually look at the actual contents of the email we can see here that the actual sending of the email was not verified through some server. If it had come from eBay then there would have been some verification of the original sending email server. An example of uh, phishing is this and this is an example of a pre putting pressure on a user so you can see here that many people are, are worried about their, their EB ratings and they don't want bad feedback so in this case you can see here it's almost a pidgin English uh, question which is quite worrying for, for the user unfortunately once the user clicks this button here uh, they will be asked to put their username and password in and that will go to the, the intruder. Again all the links look, look correct but when we run our cursor over them we can see there that the, the destination IP address isn't the same one as, as what is in the email message. We can also get uh, ones related to a security, security 
problem. Many users are worried that their password could have been changed and so on. And again, this link doesn't actually go to, to where it says in, in the link. Okay, so here's, here's a, another example of that. And again, it looks as if there's been some, some contact here for the user. When we look at this one, this one actually gives the user ID and, and login with inside the email. But we can actually see when we look at the actual code with inside the email, then the action on the button here is to send it to a, to a check email site, which is fairly generic for receiving uh, email messages. It is likely once it's received there, it will then get sent to the intruder and the user's user ID and password could be compromised. There are various key principles and involved in security and the section looks at some, some of the most important ones. One that we have is defense in, in depth. And that has a military analogy uh, where we typically use low level defense for a first line defense, but uh, more tougher, second line, third line tougher still, and then fourth line uh, high defense. For this, we typically use different layers of defense and make sure that uh, if an intruder breaches one level of defense, then it can take some time to breach the next and the next. And we can also have what are called intrusion detection agents at each of the levels to be able to detect that there's been an attack or a breach of a line of defense. So defense in depth tries to put as many boundaries in the way of an intruder uh, as possible. The first level could be a fairly generic a defense, could be a, a firewall. Then we go up maybe with a username and password. Then up through the privileges could be some biometrics login for, an, for a user. And then at the end it could be some uh, physical token. We also have the principle of uh, a demilitarized zone where we have our side, which is trusted, we have outside, which is untrusted, and then we have a place where the trusted and untrusted can meet, and that's defined as the demilitarized zone. It is in this zone that we can we can enhance uh, security and or relax it. So a system that we might have is that uh, we might have a defense such as a firewall, firewall here, demilitarized zone. We might uh, isolate our network from outside, and set up intrusion detection systems, and so on. And defense in depth is all about setting up many obstacles for an intruder to get over before they can actually uh, compromise a system. Because security is, is a fairly complex uh, entity to analyze, we typically break it up into various levels. So the OSI uh, model allows us to break the data communications uh, over a network into various layers. So we take uh, the data itself, we pass it into some application protocol, this might include HTTP, FTP, and so on. Then we use some sort of secure connections, such as for uh, TC we, we use a connection transport, such as TCP. And the network identifies the network source and destination, such as for uh, IP level. Then we have the data link and physical uh, layers, which typically identify the network that we're using. So the protocols that we typically see here are IP. The protocols here are TCP. And we might get HTTP if we're using a web page. The biggest problem is that these protocols are seen as being fairly insecure. 
So HTTP and so on are now being replaced by HTTPS, uh, SSH, SFTP and so on. For TCP we can see that we get uh, secure sockets and proxy servers. At the IP level we have uh, network address translation and firewalls. At the data link level we can have uh, web encryption keys for wireless uh, and, and so on. And then at the physical level, we can have uh, that to physical of protection of the equipment using padlocks, fiber cables, and, and so on. If we want to keep our core data secure, then we might use encryption initially. There is another model, which is the internet model, which is equivalent, and it typically merges these three top layers into one and also uh, merges the data link layer into the network layer. So overall we've looked at some of the key fundamental areas including risk and, as, and especially a cost benefit analysis. We looked at the basics of a security policy and then looking at some of the threats, phishing, denial of service and uh, so on. Then finally, we looked at some of the key principles involved, such as the demilitarized zone and also defense in depth.